Well, there is no place anywhere around this place quite like this place, so this must be the place. Welcome again to Wednesday in the Word. Pastor Kevin here with you. Joyce Ann will be with me here in a moment as well. And we are glad to be with you on another Wednesday evening around the Word of God. What exciting, thrilling, and yes, frightening times from a natural perspective to be alive. But I tell you what, we as believers have hope in this world. We have a Savior. We have a God. We uh, do not have to be in fear. We do not have to be in dread. No, we trust God and believe His Word. And we're going to, um, as we study the Word, we're going to get God's perspective on things. If you want to know what God thinks about something, you don't get that from the news media. You have to get that from the Word of God. Now, and that's what we look at on the, in these sessions on Wednesday evening. Now, let's have a word of prayer, and then we will dive into where we are going tonight. We believe it will be a blessing and encouragement and a help to you, but let's pray over the word. Father, we thank you for your holy written word. We thank you, Lord, tonight that you will help us in the word. We thank you that the teacher abides within the blessed Holy Spirit, who will guide and direct us in the word tonight. We believe to behold wondrous things from thy law tonight. We ask that you would bless in this time, open our understanding, Holy Spirit, to be able to behold great and wonderful things in the word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, and Vince says, trust in God. Yes, sir, brother, and welcome right up front. Trust in God. That's what we do as believers. We trust in God. It's in God we trust. Amen. Amen. So, all Amen. right. All right. Well, I tell you what, we are continuing our series on angels and the unseen realm this week. This realm, again, as we have said, though unseen, is very real. There is much activity in this realm. And a good evening there to Glenda, and welcome to you. The unseen realm, the spirit realm, has the Holy Trinity in it. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There are a vast host of angels in this realm, as well as fallen angels and demon spirits. And I'll tell you, I am convinced other beings and entities we don't even know about, but yet that exist in the spirit realm. This realm exercises influence and control over nations and various regions of the world. We will get into that tonight, by the way. And I think given the fact that as we are here live on um, October the 11th, 2023, Last Saturday, our, our dear Israeli friends uh, were attacked by Hamas. There are many Israelis dead. There have been terrible atrocities committed in this war. And, and really, you can, you can only say that it's demonic, things that are going on there. And we'll, we'll kind of get into tonight how angels um, influence nations and how that works. And we'll get into a little bit of that. But uh, we're going to pick up this time where we closed last time. Now, you'll recall, as we brought last week's session to an end, we were talking about the question we took up was, who was the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? Now, we said there were three options. <clears throat> Pardon me. And hello there to Diane and, and our brother John as well. Good evening. And... Um, we said there were three options. One, people believe, some people believe that the angel of the Lord was the Lord's personal angel. There are some who subscribe to that. There are some who have said that the angel of the Lord was God the Father temporarily taking on human flesh and appearing to man. There are those who subscribe to that view. But I said the third option is the one I subscribe to, and it is the one that says that the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament was an appearance of God, the second person of the Trinity, as we know today into the New Covenant, Jesus 
Christ our Lord, Yahweh our Lord, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. And uh, I had said that I subscribe to this angel of the Lord being Jesus in a pre-incarnate or before he took on flesh form. And that's where we're going to pick back up this week because we left off with that last time. But the case for the angel of the Lord being, the, being God the Son. The evidence from these appearance, appearances has convinced many that at certain times in the past, God took upon himself a human form to appear to people as this one known as the angel of the Lord. Now, this being the case, we need to examine the evidence to see which member of the Trinity the angel of the Lord, uh, or which member of the Trinity, I should say, became the angel of the Lord. That's, that's a better way to say it. If the angel of the Lord was truly an appearance of God in human form, okay, it seems that, if, that it is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, who made these appearances. Now, therefore, before he came to earth as a human being, the pre-incarnate Christ, okay, appeared to a number of people on a few select occasions. Now, the reasoning is as follows for this, okay? For one thing, the angel is called Yahweh, the Lord. He is identified with God himself. Therefore, the angel, of, is, the angel is the Lord himself. Although the angel is called the Lord, he is sometimes treated as a distinct person, from the Lord, and this really lines up perfectly with the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, where the three members are distinct from one another. In the doctrine of the Trinity, we say there is one God manifest in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we must identify which member, then, the angel of the Lord is. The best candidate, again, I submit to you, is God the Son, Jesus Christ. The identification with God the Son, Jesus Christ, is made as follows. Number one, and this one probably is the most obvious, but number one, only, the, only God the Son has assumed a human body. Now, in the, in the New Testament, uh, the, God the Father is unseen, as is God the Holy Spirit, while we hear the voice of the Father on a number of occasions, and the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove. Now, understand the Holy Spirit was not a dove. I've seen, um, you know, some movies depict Jesus, or depict rather the Holy Spirit at Jesus' baptism being a dove. Well, the Holy Spirit is not a dove. He never was a dove, but the Bible says that he descended in bodily form like a dove and landed upon Messiah Jesus at his baptism. But only God the Son took upon himself a human body. Therefore, it's consistent with what we know about God the Son that he would appear in a human body on a few select occasions during the Old Testament period before he became a man in the per a human being in the person of Jesus Christ in the New Testament era. So that's one thing. Number two, the nature of the ministry of the angel of the Lord identifies him with God the Son. Now, while one looks at the ministry of the angel of the Lord, it's consistent with the ministry of God the Son. How so? Well, the angel of the Lord is sent to, to God's people to reveal his truth. While God the Son was sent to the world to reveal God's truth, as well, by the way, as to reveal what God is like. You know, if you want to know what God is like, God the Father is like, all you need to do is look at Jesus in the Gospels because what Jesus did is what God the Father would do. Jesus said, I only do what my Father is doing. I only say what my Father is saying. So if you want to know how God, what God the Father would do, you need to look at Jesus because he came to reveal him. All right, now... Um, as the New Testament indicates that the Father sent the Son into the world, God the Father also sent the angel of the Lord 
into certain situations during the Old Testament period. So that's a couple things. Number three, though, the angel of the Lord. Now, this is an interesting um, observation, but the angel of the Lord is not um, identified with the Lord in the New Testament. Now, in the New Testament, all references to angels are to either human or angelic beings. Now, the word Hebrew word translated angel is malek, and the Greek word translated angel throughout the New Testament is angelos. Un actually, angelos, pardon me, angelos. So, in both cases, malek or angelos, they can be translated as messenger or a sent messenger. But as you look in the New Testament, um, a messenger or an angelos can be either a human or it can be an actual divine being. Now, um, in fact, in one instance, interestingly enough, in 2 Corinthians 12, where the Bible is talking about Paul's thorn in the flesh, the, uh, Paul identifies his thorn in the flesh as a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. That, that word translated messenger there is that Greek word angelos. So it was an angel, if you will, of Satan sent to harass and buffet the apostle Paul. So that's one example where an angelos actually referred to a fallen angel or an evil being. But anyway, in the New Testament, it's either angels or humans, but that Greek word angelos. All right. Now, um, there's no instance where the angel of the Lord is mentioned with the Lord himself. This gives further indication, I'm talking about the New Testament now, this gives further indication that once God became a human being in the person of Jesus Christ, it was no longer necessary for him to appear to select people as an angel in human form. These arguments are used to show that the angel of the Lord and God the Son are one and the same person. Okay, now here's another one, number four. Sometimes the angel of the Lord is actually God, while at other times he's only an angel. Now, while the angel of the Lord is sometimes identified with the Lord himself, there are other times when they are distinguished. And really, uh, it's, it's, it's concluded that on some occasions, the angel of the Lord was indeed God himself, while at other times, he was merely a messenger sent from the Lord. And it, the, it's the context, and this is, the true, this is true with a lot of things in the Bible, but the context that it appears in must determine the identity of the angel of the Lord. If the angel of the Lord was, in some instances, God the Son, Jesus Christ, coming in a temporary body, then the, the term angel stresses the basic meaning of the word as one sent. God the Son was sent by God the Father. Therefore, the word angel in that context, okay, would be referring to the office of the one who sent a messenger. Now, this is in keeping with the, with the mission uh, of, of the nature of the mission of Jesus. Indeed, he is the one whom the Father has sent. In fact, Jesus himself said of himself, he said, I am, the, I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. That's John 8, 18. If, however, um, if, however it is one of the angelic hosts, okay, referred to as the angel of the Lord, then it is the nature of the being that is being stressed. In other words, he is one of the heavenly hosts, a created being who was sent from the Lord. This really sums up the arguments for the angel of the Lord uh, being a theophany or an appearance of God in a physical form. Okay, that's where we were last time. Wanted to sew that up. Any questions or comments about that section? If you do, um, chat them in and uh, we'll be glad to address them if you have anything. Amen. All right. Well, here is an interesting area that we're going to get into. The question we're taking up now, remember we've been, you know, approaching these as questions that people often ask about angels. This one is, is I think, very relevant 
to where we are in time right now. And the question is, are angels connected with the various nations? Are angels connected with the various angel nations? Now, let me give a little background. If you take advantage of our notes, these will be some things that are not in the notes, but I want to give just a little foundational background here to this section. We have a God who is so amazingly merciful and kind to his creation. Okay, we do. So, after the fall of man, God in his infinite mercy, he assigned his certain angels to watch over the affairs of man on his behalf. They're referred to as watchers. Okay, now, Fast forward to the dispersion of the nations from Babylon. Now, if you look at Genesis chapter 10 and 11, you will see what is known as the Table of Nations. There were a total of 70 nations, and these would have come from the descendants of Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, But they, they formed 70 distinct nations. Now, I don't have a lot of time to, de to develop this, but God put one of his angels in charge of all of those nations. Then you come to G uh, Genesis chapter 12. He chooses a man by the name of Abram, and from Abram, Abraham later, and his descendants came the 12 sons of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, and came the nation of Israel, a people separate and distinct, and by the, by the choice of God, by the way, separate and distinct from all nations of the world. Now, I said all that to say this, these angels, many of these angels whom God set over the nations, they were to represent God to the nations, but many of them rebelled and began to draw attention to themselves. That's where really you see the birth of all idolatry. These angels began to draw attention to themselves. Okay, um, let's leave that right there because I don't have any more time to develop that. But we do find from Scripture, I want to submit to you, that we do find from Scripture that there is a connection between angels and the different nations of the world. And in fact, the activity in the spirit realm will govern what happens in those regions of the world where those angels are in charge. And we're going to see more about that. But understand that the spirit realm is driving things that happen in the natural realm. Okay, now... When the Jews were about to return from captivity, they had been in captivity for some 70 years almost by this time. The prophet Daniel began to pray about them coming back. He began to seek the Lord for himself and his people, the Jews. He began to seek the Lord for his people, Israel. Now, at this time, the Jews were under the control of the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire was the world power in charge at the time that this occasion that we're going to be talking about happened, okay? So, after three weeks of prayer, 21 days, about three weeks of prayer, an angel appeared to Daniel, and he explained to Daniel the reason for the delay. I got to tell you. When we pray, God hears. When we pray, our, our prayers enter the throne room. They do. And when they enter the throne room, God will send an answer. Now, in this case, in other cases, this is true too, probably. But in this case, he dispatched an angel to bring Daniel's answer. Now, now we're going to see something here. All right. The book of Daniel explained why it happened. In other words, why there was this three-week delay in the answer. And I want to read this section of Scripture from 
One of my favorite translations of the Bible, this happens to be the Tree of Life version, TLV. I love this translation. And I want to read this, and you can turn in your Bible if you want, but we're going to look at Daniel chapter 10, and we're going to notice verses 7 through 14. So seven verses, 7 through 14. This is going to explain why there was a three-week delay in Daniel's answer. All right, here it is. Verse 7. Only I, now, now this, this angel had come to, to Daniel, he's described here in the verses before, but I'm going to pick up with seven. And I put in the notes, if you get our notes, I put this in there in the New, New English translation, the NET, but I'm going to read it here from the Tree of Life version. Anyway, verse seven says, Only I, Daniel, saw the vision. The men that were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, such a great terror fell upon them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone to see this great vision. My strength drained from me and my vigor was destroyed. I could not summon any strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words when I heard him speaking. I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. This is a common response when a divine being appears to a human being common response. Okay, verse 10, Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. Verse 11, He said to me, Daniel, highly valued man, carefully consider the words I am speaking to you. Stand up, for now I have been sent to you. When he spoke this word to me, I stood up trembling. Verse 12 says, Then he said to me, Don't be afraid, Daniel. For from the first day, when? The first day. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, the first day, your words were heard. And he goes on to say, this is a still a fairly new Bible, so my pages are kind of stuck together here, just a moment. But he says, I have come because of your words. However, this is the reason for the three-week delay. He says, however, the prince of the kingdom of Persia resisted me for 21 days, but behold, Michael, one of the chief princes. Now, we find out later in Daniel that Michael is the angel assigned specifically to Israel. Okay? So, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I had been detained there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future days for the vision concerns days yet to come. Now, we really learn several very important principles about angels being involved in nations from this passage. First of all, we discover there is a spiritual battle occurring. For the, from the first day that Daniel set his heart to seek the Lord for his people, the Bible says the very first day, the angel was sent, number one, the first day his words were heard, and the angel was dispatched to bring his answer the very first day. But what happened? He was hindered, the Bible says, by the prince of Persia. Now, Persia again was the ruling empire at this time. Persia, Persia, by the way, is modern day Iran. Interestingly enough, in fact, until about the mid 1930s, the, the, the people known as Iranians today were known still as Persians. Persians. Yeah. The ancient kingdom of Persia takes in what is today modern Iran. It really takes in a little bit of Iraq, but that's beside the point. But think about this prince of Persia. This was not an earthly ruler. Why do you say that, Pastor Kevin? Because an earthly ruler could not hinder an angel. 
No, this was a principality in the spirit realm above the kingdom of Persia, and this spirit being in the in the spirit realm above Persia was running and controlling the things that happened in the kingdom of Persia in the natural kingdom. So in other words, there was a spiritual kingdom above the, the physical kingdom running things in that kingdom. Okay, now, amen. The interesting thing is, like I said a moment ago, the ancient kingdom of Persia is modern-day Iran. And guess what? Right now, as we are doing this session live on Wednesday evening, the 11th of October, 2023, Iranian-backed Hamas, and Hamas, by the way, translates into English as violence, interestingly enough. But Hamas attacked Israel last Saturday, as we do this live, last Saturday, Hamas began to bomb Israel. There is a war there. There's been war declared. There's war going on. Okay? So, you've got ancient Persia, which is modern-day Iran. And here's what I wanted you to see. That prince of Persia who was over that kingdom in Daniel's day, is still there. And they hate Israel. They hate America, by the way. There have been demonstrations in the streets again saying death to Israel, death to the United States, and this is purely, I want you to know, demonic, what we see occurring in the state of Israel tonight brothers and sisters, is demonic. It is being orchestrated by the prince of Persia. Yes, there are natural players on the field, but they are being controlled, if you will, driven. The strings are being pulled by the prince of Persia that was there in the days of Daniel. So, yes, there is a spiritual battle occurring. It took the angel 21 days to answer Daniel's prayer because of the kingdom of Persia hindering him. Obviously, again, this could not have been an earthly prince restraining an angel. Therefore, the passage speaks of a spiritual battle that is occurring in the heavenly realm. Yeah. In the New Testament, we find this truth emphasized. Paul said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but what did he say? But against principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness, and hosts of spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realms. That is where this battle is occurring. There is indeed a spiritual battle. Okay. The second thing we see is that the prince of Persia is overseeing the nation. The prince of Persia seems to be, and I say is, the angel that was overseeing this nation, and he's still there. For some reason, he was opposed to revealing this message to Daniel about what would occur in the future. Amen. So you've got to understand, and this is a far bigger subject than I have time to cover in this session tonight, but you've got to go back to the original, very first prophecy of the Bible to figure out why this battle has been raging all, this, all these years and why the devil, that's right, why the devil and fallen angels and demon spirits hate the nation of Israel, hate the Jewish people. Why? Because the very first prophecy of the Bible said the seed of the woman would crush his head. Even though the seed of the serpent would bruise his heel, he said he will crush your head. And so, the battle of the ages ensued, and Satan, down through the centuries of time, sought to keep the seed of the woman from coming into the earth realm. But guess what? He failed. But guess what? Again, his battle still rages because he hates 
anything and anyone that God loves. That's right. Come on. Yes. He hates anything and anyone that God loves or that loves God. And I got to tell you, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> in this day and age, it seems that there's a terrible attack on families. Yes. Uh, Satan has just tore families apart. Yep. And we really need to pray for that because that's not normal, natural, or anything. No, we it's a spiritual loving, battle. Loving families. And yeah. He has just in our church, mm -hmm. in our in our family. Even, yes, Ta attacking, attacking attacking families, attacking families, attacking yes. marriages. See, here's the thing. God in the originally the very first institution that God ever ordained was the family. Marriage and the family was the very first institution God ordained in the garden. Adam and Eve were the first couple. Amen. He ordained he ordained um, marriage. Marriage and the family between one man and one woman. Well, guess what? That's under attack. Why? Because it's a spiritual battle. You know? Well, not only that, but back to way back to when Jesus was born. Mm -hmm. The whole thing Right. Uh, of Jesus being born. Right. And his family. Well, there again, there again, the seed of the woman, you know, um, the seed of the woman. He was out to destroy the seed. And when he failed to get the seed, you know, when the wise men, that we, the magi, we call them the wise men, they came and they came to worship uh, Messiah and Herod said, hey, when you go worship him, tell me where he's at so I can go worship him too. He didn't want to worship him. He wanted to kill him. And then when he failed to kill Jesus, what did he do? He turned his wrath on the children, male children, two years and under in his domain and began to slaughter them all. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. so, God ordained human government. Well, guess what? There's all kinds of spiritual battles in governments. And he ordained the church. Well, guess what? Satan hates the church. He hates believers. He hates the Jews. He hates families. Yes. Amen. Yes. And so, Try this... so hard to yeah, steal. Steal, kill, kill, steal, kill. and destroy. Yes. Yeah, that's the whole, that's the whole end game here. Yeah, all right. But, let's go back to this. Now, Though no specific details are given, we're informed by this passage, what I read in Daniel 10, all right, that there was an angel overseeing Persia in the same way that the Lord used Michael as the overseer of the nation of Israel. And guess what? Michael is still over the nation of Israel. In fact, he will stand up, the Bible says, in the time of the end for his people Israel. Amen. Okay. Yes. Now, while we're not told why this particular prince of Persia didn't want Daniel to receive the answer to his prayer, it seems that two things come into play here. First, Persia is the kingdom that was ruling over Israel at this time. We've already said that. Recall that when Babylon fell, okay, the authority over Israel was now in the Persian Empire. Okay, because the kingdom that followed Babylon, you go you have to go back, we don't have time to go all through all this, but you go back to Daniel 2 and the image that Nebuchadnezzar seen, the head of gold was Babylon, well, then there was a chest of silver, that was the Medo-Persian Empire, it was the empire that followed Babylon, okay? So it was, it was in power at this time. Okay, now, um, so, for whatever reason, this angel oversee, who was overseeing Persia didn't want Daniel to have any information about the future when it specifically spoke of the Persian Empire. Now, second, and this is what I mentioned a moment ago, second, it's also worth noting that Persia, modern-day Iran, is a huge player in last day's prophecy. Know that. 
Indeed, Iran is one of the three countries, in fact, along with Russia and Turkey. That's why I find it very fascinating. And I learned this last night. Mike Evans, who is on the ground in Israel, has been for many years there. He began to talk about how Russia, interestingly enough, is supplying weapons to Iranian-backed Hamas. Russia and Iran, in other words, are, in a, are really partnering together. Russia supplying the weapons, Iran supplying the funds to Hamas to attack Israel. So keep an eye, folks, on these players because they're all on the field. Watch what happens with Iran. Watch Iraq. Watch uh, Russia. Watch these nations. Watch Syria, okay? All these nations. So, but, but uh, Persia or Iran is one of three countries along with Russia. Now, we're not getting very far tonight, but that's okay. I think we're just following the Holy Spirit here. But Iran is one of three countries along with Russia and Turkey who will be part of an evading force invading force that attacks Israel in the last days. Yes. Ezekiel 38 and 39 talk about it. And so uh, th th this is very important whenever we see, now again, you know, a lot of, you know, the, Jesus said there would be wars and rumors of wars and certainly we're seeing those. And I don't think that, you know, everything that happens over is in over Israel is necessarily a fulfillment of prophecy. But I got to tell you, when you see these specific nations of prophecy, not only saber rattling, but coming against Israel in direct attack, it ought to give us pause to watch and see what happens because we are definitely living in prophetic times. Yeah. That's what I yeah. want you to know. Okay, now, evidently, this prince of Persia didn't want Daniel to be given information with respect to end-time events that have to do with Persia, modern-day Iran. Accordingly, the angel attempted both short-term predictions about Persia as well as last-day predictions about this country. A wide, and we don't have time to go over it, but a wide amount of information is covered in the 10th and 11th chapters of Daniel. Amen. And hello there to Deb, just popped in there. Now, there is also, thirdly, the Prince of Greece. From this passage, we're informed that there is also a prince or an angel over Greece. Now, this is Daniel 10.20, and I want to go again to the Tree of Life version. Daniel 10.20 says, Then he said, do you, not, do you understand why I have come to you? The angel is asking Daniel. Now I must return to fight against the prince of Persia. When I go, behold, the prince of Greece will come. This was another principality in the spirit realm. And we know from history that the nation to follow Medo-Persia was indeed Greece. We know the first ruler of Greece was the military genius Alexander the Great. Okay, we know that from history. Okay, now... After this battle with the prince of Persia, the, this angel said the angel or prince of Greece was to come. This angel that looked after Greece, like the one over Persia, by the way, was not inclined to allow Daniel to be informed of events which were to come. We know, again, I said from history, we know that Greece was the predicted kingdom that would follow Persia in world rulership, and it did. This occurred in the 4th century before Christ. Again, it seems that the angel overseeing Greece didn't want Daniel to receive further information regarding what would happen when this empire would rule. Interestingly, and again, I wish we had the time to go over this, but we don't. Interestingly, Daniel 11, remember I said Daniel 10 and 11 had great detail in them, but Daniel 11 gives minute details 
regarding the future of the Grecian Empire before it's conquered by Rome. So to sum this up, it seems that these princes, these demonic principalities over the Persian kingdom and the eventual Grecian kingdom didn't want Daniel to receive the supernatural information with respect to their future. But guess what? He received it anyway. And we received it too because it's recorded in the Word. Amen. That's why it's important you take the time to read the Word. I mean, you know, we take the time to, you know, follow what the news media said. Why do that? Most of it's lies anyway. Amen. No, spend your time getting God's perspective on things in the Word of God. Amen. That's where you're going to know what's really coming in the time of the end, in the Word. All right. Now, fourthly, angels are described as rulers in the New Testament. When the New Testament uses the word rulers to describe the different orders or ranks of angels, this may include, and I tend to think it does, these various angels over the nations. The word is used of both good and bad angels, by the way. For example, in Ephesians 3.10, rather, Paul wrote, so that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. He said that our ultimate struggle is against these authorities, the spiritual powers in the heavenly realm. So to kind of, you know, bring this part to a close, the Lord has pulled back the curtain of the unseen realm to let us know that there are spiritual battles among angels who are, at, who are aligned with various nations. Amen. Now, while this gives us a glimpse in the unseen realm, there is obviously so much that we don't know. Therefore, we need to be careful not to speculate beyond what has been revealed. I mean, we can give observations, we can give various opinions, thoughts, insights, and all of that. But really, when it comes right down to it, we've got to stick to what has been revealed. Amen. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this covenant. Amen. Hallelujah. So there are some secret things. There are some things that we don't know about the spiritual realm and about, you know, God and, and, and heavenly things. There are a lot of things we don't know. What we do know is revealed in the Word. We ought to study it and know it. But again, there's a lot of things we don't know that eternity will reveal. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. Any questions or comments about this section on angels and their influence over nations? Boy, there's so much we could get into with this that I just don't have the time to do. But any comments or questions about this section? Go ahead and chat those in if you do. And... Uh, you know, we'll, we'll recognize them, we'll, uh, you know, address them if you have something. Amen. 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 Boy, I tell you, there is a lot of activity in the spirit realm, right now especially. I personally believe that we are living in the very end of the age. Now, we've been living in the last days for some 2,000 years. This whole period of time that we refer to as the church age, all right, that has been the last days from the time Messiah came the first time to the time he comes the second time. All of that period is the last days, okay? But there comes a point when you've arrived at the last of the last days, and I believe that's where we live. Anyway, praise the Lord. Okay, here's our next question. Who are the living creatures? They're referred to in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 4. Who are the living creatures? Now, while the subject of this section of our study is 
angels, God's invisible messengers. There are other heavenly beings that the Lord has created that are always kept distinct from the angels, okay? Um, so, who are, who, who are these living creatures? In other words, there are beings that are never sent as God's emissaries to humanity, as are the angels. The book of Ezekiel describes certain beings called living creatures. Their description is found in the opening chapter. Now, I want to read this again from the Tree of Life version, okay? And this is in Ezekiel chapter 1. Boy, I got to tell you, well, I'm, well you're, if you want to turn to Ezekiel chapter 1, go right ahead. But the very first Bible I ever got, and I've still got this Bible somewhere, I believe. Anyways, the very first Bible, uh, yeah, it's in my book somewhere. All my books, it's somewhere. I say that a lot about my books. I've got that book somewhere. You know, right now we don't know where they're all at. But anyway, the very first Bible I ever got, and I'm not proud to say this, but the very first Bible I ever got, I wanted because I had gotten a hold of the writings of Eric von Daniken, Gods from uh, Chariots of the Gods and Gods from Outer Space. I had gotten, you know, hold of that stuff. And he talked about Ezekiel's vision in chapter one of Ezekiel being a spaceship and aliens that Ezekiel saw. And I, oh, that was so exciting to me. Well, let me tell you something. Ezekiel didn't see spaceships. He didn't see aliens. He says in chapter one, very clearly, he said that he had visions of God. Okay, so let's understand that. But let's pick this up at verse five of chapter one. And the Bible says, from within it, from within what? Well, this, this, he saw a storm arise, and, and it came from the north, a great cloud with flashing fire and brightness all around it, and something like a glowing alloy or metal out of the fire. Okay? Now, verse 5 says, from within it came the likeness of four living creatures. This was their appearance. They had a likeness of a human. But each one had four faces, and each one of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the hoof of a calf. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. They had human hands under their wings. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And... Is, is that where we get the, the angels all have wings? This, th these were cherubs. That Cherubs have wings, and that's what these were. These were cherubim, cherubim, okay? okay? All right. They had human hands under their wings on their four sides. The four of them had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. They did not turn when they moved. Each could move in the direction of any of its faces. As for the form of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings touching the wing of another while the other two were covering their bodies. Now, uh, verse 12. Now each being could move in the direction of any of its faces wherever the Ruach, the spirit, would go. They went and without turning as they went. Okay, now, the description Ezekiel gives of these creatures is, I don't mind telling you, both complicated and puzzling. They're merely called living creatures and nothing more. In this context, we have no clue really as to their identity. Some think they are cherubim. I tend to believe that. Now, though the living creatures are not identified in Ezekiel 1, we may have an explanation of their identity later in Ezekiel. In another vision, Ezekiel sees heavenly creatures that he very clearly identifies as cherubim. Okay? The cherubim were standing. This is, uh, this is Ezekiel chapter 10, uh, verses 3 through 14. I'm going to read this from the NLT. Anyway, 
He says, um, the cherubim were standing at the south end of the temple when the man went in, and the glory of the cloud of glory filled the inner courtyard. Then the glory of the Lord rose up from above the cherubim and went over to the door of the temple. The temple was filled with this cloud of glory, and the temple courtyard glowed brightly with the glory of the Lord. The moving wings of the cherubim sounded like the voice of God Almighty and could be heard clearly in the outer courtyard. Um, the Lord said to the man in linen clothing, Go between the cherubim and take some burning coals from between the wheels. So the man went in and stood behind or beside one of the wheels. And by the way, boy, I don't have time to get into this, <laughs> but wheels is another distinction of heavenly beings. Wheels. But I don't have time to get into that. Okay. <laughs> so the man went in and stood beside one of the wheels. Then one of the cherubim reached out his hand and took some live coals from the fire burning among them. He put the coals into the hands of the man in linen clothing, and the man took them and went out. All the cherubim had what looked like human hands hidden beneath their wings. Each of the four cherubim had a wheel beside him, and the wheels sparkled like chrysolite. All four wheels looked the same. Each wheel had a second wheel turning crosswise within it. The cherubim could move forward in any of the four directions they faced. Without turning as they moved, they went straight in the direction in which their heads were turned, never turning aside. Both the cherubim and the wheels were covered with eyes. Wow. The cherubim had eyes all over their bodies, including their hands, their backs, and their wings. I heard someone refer to the wheels as the whirling wheels. Each of the four cherubim had four faces. The first was the face of an ox. The second was a human face. The third was the face of a lion. And the fourth was the face of an eagle. That's Ezekiel 10, 3 through 14 in the NLT. Now, beyond this description, uh, because this description, rather, is like chapter 1, many think they are two different descriptions of the same creatures, the cherubim. I tend to think that, okay? Now, Revelation 4 speaks of living creatures. Some identify them with the four living creatures spoken of in the book of Revelation. The Bible says, and this is in Revelation 4, 7, the living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with a face like a human face, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. So it's almost identical. What you see in the throne room of heaven in Revelation 4 is almost identical with the visions of God that Ezekiel had in chapter 1. Okay, now, they seem to be representative of various parts of God's creation. Humanity, domesticated animals, the wild beasts, and the birds. Now, I also tend to believe, and I don't have time to get into this, but I also tend to believe that there is a direct correlation between the appearance of these four living creatures and how Jesus is represented in the four Gospels. But again, we don't have time to really develop that thought. But anyway, I kind of throw these things out once in a while as they come to me. But anyway, these living creatures worship God continually. The Bible tells us more about them. Each of them, that's these living beings, had six wings, and their wings were covered with eyes inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Wow. Now, I got to tell you, there really isn't enough information for us to be certain, but I got to tell you, these descriptions are amazingly interesting. You know, they really are. 
But though these beings are like the ones spoken of in Ezekiel, there are some differences between them. Whether they are the same creatures with slightly different descriptions or two similar types of heavenly creatures, we can't be certain. There's simply not enough information. But I tell you what, that's why I'm convinced that there are a lot of things in heaven, a lot of things in the spirit realm we have no knowledge of. So it is really the height of arrogance, I think, on our part if we would think that we do know everything that's there because we don't. Amen. And while we're at it, let's say this. In these last of the last days, a lot of the things in that realm are coming over into this realm. You know, I think in these last of the last days, we're going to, be, we're going to see more angelic appearances, more supernatural occurrences. Now, see, here's the thing. You got to be open to it. You got, you, got to, you got to have a heart that says, you know, Lord, whatever you have, whatever you want to do, you know, we have to be open to whatever God wants to do. You know, sometimes we want to put God in our little religious boxes and think, well, God can only move in this way, in this fashion. But I'm going to tell you something. God's a whole lot bigger than any of us. Come on. That's right. He's a whole lot bigger than you. He's a whole lot bigger than me. He's a whole lot bigger than what we can figure out in our finite human understanding. So the best thing to do is just say, you know, Lord, you're God and I'm not. <laughs> Amen. Um, I'm not going to have time to get into this part I was going to get into now. Our next question was going to be, who are the cherubim? Who are the cherubim? And that's where we're going to pick up next time. And I just don't think we have enough time because we would just get it started. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't have time to really, you know, develop it. But let me just say this. You need to, if you don't know, number one, if you happen to see this, maybe you, you know, you're out there on Facebook and you just are curious. I wonder what that guy is having to say. You know, what's he saying now? Well, here's what I'm saying now. If you don't know Jesus, you need to know him. If you've never been born again, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, it's time to stop playing games. It's time to stop straddling the fence. It's time to stop halting between two opinions. It's time to make a decision because the time is short, beloved. You don't have a, a whole lot of time. Now, I know a lot of people that would scoff at that and say, oh, you know, you've been saying that for years. But I'm telling you, there has never been a time like this time in the history of mankind when all of the signs, all of the prophecies, all of the things are lining up in one generation. You see, Jesus said the generation that sees all of these prophetic signs needs to be looking up because their redemption draws nigh. And that's, I believe, where we live. So, if you don't know Jesus, here it is. The Bible says, all who will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you would be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salve, unto salvation. So say with your mouth, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I believe that God raised you from the dead. I yield my life to you. Come into my heart right now and be my Lord and be my Savior. The Bible says in Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your house. Amen. So that's what I would tell you in closing tonight. Receive Jesus if you don't know him and if you do know him. Amen. Come on. If you do know him, serve him with all your heart and all your life. Give him everything you have. Amen. Because he is worthy to receive it. All right. Well, I'm out of time once again. Thank you for being with us. Now, I want to go back and uh, 
welcome some of our folks. I didn't get everybody greeted. I just want to go back and do that. I think I did, but I just want to make sure. Hey, good evening there again to Vince, our dear sister Glinda, dear sister Diane, John, no doubt they're with you. Um, brother Sean says, I'll be watching later. Wonderful, brother. I appreciate that. Glinda says, help us, Jesus. Uh, our sister Deb, who's there, she says, uh, a, uh, she says um, I'm going to back up. My, I skipped ahead there a little bit. Uh, she says, hello, and hello to you, sister. She says, yes, thank you, God. Glinda comments, yes, it is. Time is short for accepting Christ as your Savior. It really is. Amen. Amen. And uh, I'm going to tell you, you know, a lot of these people that are out there laughing and scoffing and making fun of those of us who, you know, preach Jesus. I'm going to tell you what, they'll be just like the people who, want, who, who laughed at Noah in the days before the flood. Amen. Then when the flood came, guess what? The Bible says they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood took them all away. There's going to come a time, beloved, when it's too late. When it's too late. Don't wait to that. Amen. All right. Pray for Israel. Pray for Israel. There Pray. Were 700, how many babies? Oh, there were, I forget, I had a news story earlier. They have been, here's, here's, how, here's how you know this, is, this deal's demonic. These guys have gone up and there have been baby carriages with bullet holes where they've gone up and they've shot babies. They have found Israeli babies. Now, I'm not trying to be graphic here, but they have found many Israeli babies who've been decapitated by these people, the Hamas, you know. This tells you, this tells you the spirit of it. Amen. It's demonic. Yes. You know, and, and, and God help anybody. Now, listen, I know there are innocent people on both sides of this thing that have been hurt. Okay. I know there are innocent Palestinians and there are innocent Israelis who've been caught in the middle of this. But you got to remember who started this thing. It wasn't Israel. And guess what? If somebody would sweep in tomorrow, God forbid, and they would destroy Florida, huh. do you think the United States would sit by and say, well, and they, they wouldn't go out and destroy them? And what makes anybody think that Israel, who were attacked, they don't have the right to defend themselves? Well, guess what? They do. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. If you, if you are on a side against Israel, not saying they do everything right or perfectly, they don't. But if you're on a side against Israel, friend, you're on the wrong side. That's all I'm going to tell you. Amen. You're on the wrong side. Amen. You're wrong-headed. You're wrong. Amen. Anyway, Sunday morning at the church, I plan to do an update and give some perspective of what is going on in the world right now in Israel, give a little bit of biblical background on it, Help us to understand what's going on and how to help us to understand how, what to pray for. Amen. So that's coming up Sunday morning, 10 o'clock at the church. We're at 2028 Crawford right here in Boone. We meet at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. We would like to invite you to come. We're right in the corner of 21st and Crawford here in Boone. And uh, we'd like to invite you to join with us. And if you can't, the same place you get this study on Wednesday night, you can pick up our live stream of our service and join us that way. But either way, we want to invite you to be with us Sunday or, you know, pick it up later like some do with this study on Wednesday night. They can't be here live. They pick it up later. Well, do that with the church service and we believe that you will be blessed. Amen. Well, any other, uh, and Brother Vince says prayers for Israel. He says, I will be watching. Thank you. Brother, we appreciate that. You are, I'm telling you, you have, You've become one of our most faithful folk, and I, I really appreciate that. Thank you, my brother. Anyway, uh, any other comments or questions before we, uh, we're, we're past the bottom of the hour, so we need to wound, wind up, but any other comments or questions that you have, please chat those in right now. We're going to give you about another minute, and then we're going to close with the blessing, the, the ironic blessing from Numbers chapter 6 that we speak over you every week. And uh, so we're going to be doing that if you if you don't have any comments or questions. 
Any other comments or questions? Last call. All right. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you shalom. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Bible says prosperity is in the house of those who pray for peace, the peace of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Hey, and remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Blessings to you.